How can we hear and imagine the musical ideas that we want to play on an instrument? Or perhaps the better question is, how can we understand and assign meaning to these ideas as we play them? This process is called audiation, and it's a critical process for the jazz musician when they want to improvise. Hi, I'm Joshua Hatcher, and I'm the head of Woodwinds here at JMI. I also teach ensemble classes and the second year theory students. At JMI, we want to create a world where everyone can play jazz. The first thing I want to talk about is that we must know a key center. A lot of improvising happens inside the space of a tonality or a key center. You might also think of this as a key or a key signature. There's lots of terms for this idea. And it's critical for jazz musicians that we understand the architecture of the key center, or the tonality that we're playing in. Some of the musical elements that allow us to understand and know our key centers well are things like scales, intervals, arpeggios, and other musical patterns that we can practice on an instrument and learn the sound of and keep them in our ears. One exercise that I find really useful for learning the intervals in a key and the sound of the intervals in the key specifically as well is an exercise of expanding intervals, diatonic intervals, so intervals from the key center. I'll start at the root and build the intervals expanding as I go all the way up to the perfect octave. Sounds like this. You can also do the same exercise in a descending form to learn the sound of the expanding intervals as you go down the scale too. Those sets of intervals were from the concert E flat major scale. Knowing this sound by playing it on your instrument is the first step. But then to really understand and be able to reproduce this sound whenever you want to, or components of this sound, like the individual intervals from that series of intervals, I think it's really important that you can actually try to produce this sound with your voice. This is the scary part, I think, for a lot of instrumentalists because unless you're a singer, you might not have a great relationship with your voice. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I encourage all of my students to sing, thinking of their voice as not so much of an instrument and more a tool in their musical learning. In this way, it gives you permission to perhaps not sound so great while you're singing, but to still get the benefit of using your voice for learning. So, now that we've familiarized ourselves with the sound of that pattern, we could practice singing and producing those intervals in the concert E flat major scale with our voice. Something like this. Da, 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 da. It doesn't sound great but it doesn't matter. We could try descending as well, just like the, the second part of the exercise. Da, 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 da. Doesn't sound any better on the way down either, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You've got to use your voice if you want to learn this stuff. The next part of the process is not just taking a sound and reproducing the sound, but assigning meaning to that sound. 
There are all sorts of systems that people use for creating this meaning or assigning this meaning. Some people use solfege, which is actually where you, it's actually the French alphabet singing through the notes of the scale. I prefer to just work in English because that's my language. Uh, the, my system that I like to use is thinking about the degrees of the key. So that would be the seven notes of a major scale in this case. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can call it eight, you can call it one, because it's, it's like the, the, the root displaced by an octave, doesn't really matter. Whatever system works for you is fine. If you want to do solfege, that's great too. Some people also like to do solfege with the hand signals and all this kind of stuff. Whatever works for you is fine. All right. So then once we can actually get through the scale using degrees like that, we could also try doing that same exercise that I sang through before using the numbers as well. This means that we go beyond just pure sound and we're trying to assign meaning to that sound. Let's try it. One, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, one, seven, one, eight. Descending. One, seven, one, six, one, five, one, four, one, three, one, two, one, one. There you go. I called it one at the top on the way down. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. One and eight, they're, they're the same note displaced by an octave. Those are just a couple of examples of exercises you can work on playing and singing and assigning meaning to them as you work on audiation. Another couple of exercises that you could take to work with would be things like doing scales in thirds. And so forth. You could also do diatonic triads. And so forth. You could also try doing your diatonic seventh chords. And on and on it goes. To continue to progress these exercises, you can also try out different permutations where you could do uh, one interval ascending and the next interval descending or vice versa, descending and ascending or everything descending. There's lots of ways to do these exercises and get a lot of value out of working on a very small amount of material. Once we're feeling familiar with the intervals inside of the key center and we've locked in the architecture of that key, we can start being creative with that skill and putting it out in a sort of a more of a real world setting where we're not trying to just reproduce something, but we're actually trying to interpret something that we're hearing or perhaps create something new, improvisation. One way that you can put this into action is when you hear a diatonic melody, you actually try to assign meaning to the intervals that you're hearing rather than just pressing, pressing down keys on your instrument or slapping your finger down on a fret or something like that and having a shot in the dark. Before you even touch your instrument, try to figure out what those intervals are and develop that sense of reliance and trust in your ears. Once you've familiarized yourself with the intervals inside of a key, it's time for us to start, try to start improvising with that. So let's try a short exercise. I'm going to sing a melody. I'm then going to try and assign the intervals to the notes in that melody. Then I'm going to play the melody on my saxophone. Again, we're in concert E flat major. So here's the short melody. Da, 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 da. Now, first thing I have to do is find my tonic. Duh. Very conveniently, I've started my melody on the tonic. So good, there's our first note, one. Duh. Now I need to see if there's anything familiar that I can find in that melody. Duh, 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 duh. 
There are two components to that melody that I find familiar. The first is a major triad. So the first three notes are one, three, five, from the key center. The second component is a short scalar passage where I'm actually just going from one note in the scale to its neighbor and then back to the first note again. Five, four, five. If I put those two together, I have the whole melody. One, three, five, four, five. I'm now confident that if I put that on my saxophone, I'm gonna get exactly the same sound. Let's try. I played one, three, five, four, five on my saxophone from that major scale, and I was able to imagine it, assign meaning to that sound, and then play it on my instrument. Okay, so we've learned about the intervals inside of the key center that help us understand how to hear and create and improvise diatonic melodies. That's the first step. But if you want to improvise this, particularly in the world of jazz, you need to listen to jazz music because then we understand what sort of intervals are used in jazz that make up jazz melodies. So the final takeaway I want you to have from this is to listen to jazz music. I hope you found that helpful and I hope it helps with specifically your knowledge of the key center and your ability to hear music and imagine it and assign meaning to it before you go to play it. Leave a comment below with which song you think has the most interesting intervals.